today we're we're taking a little bit of a different tack here at Move LA, and we're start. We wanted to talk about something that we really haven't focused that much on, uh, which is our uh, medium and long distance travel opportunities in the state of California, and how we really get big reductions in car travel and reducing vehicle miles traveled uh, with fewer single occupancy vehicles in the state of California. So a little bit more of a uh, broader scope today, and we hope you enjoy this program. Uh, and thank you all, again to all of our sponsors who make programs accessible like this and who support our work on public transit, affordable housing, climate change, and clean air. The state of California must reduce emissions by 45% below 2010 levels by 2030. Uh, I think somebody posted yesterday that that is 99 months away, which is not a lot of time. The transportation sector, when you include oil refining extraction, extraction accounts for 50% of California's greenhouse gas emissions. Passenger cars and truck account for almost three quarters of that total. So the resources board estimates that we have about 15 to 16% reductions necessary by 2035 of vehicle miles travel, which is about 2.9 to 3.5 vehicle miles per capita, so that per person per day below the baseline number, which they estimate at 22 miles per day per, per person in California. We got 40 million people. That's a lot of miles. Um, I'll post the link to that actually. You know, here at Move LA, and you know, I got an uh, an email from one of our good friends, uh, Rick Cole, who's now at the Congress for um, New Urbanism. And well, what about land use policy? By gosh, we believe that's very important, and we've actually had several zooms on that, and we will have some in the future. Um, and so is pricing policy. How do we price uh, our roadways and incentivize or disincentivize people from driving? We're going to talk about those in the future, but we thought that. You know, we wanted to focus today on kind of these opportunities, these great opportunities in the state, because we are obsessed with cars. You know, our personal vehicles, especially electric vehicles, as well as Uber and Lyft, we're so obsessed with them that we forget there are many ways to get around, including our bus and rail system. And we really don't have to drive single occupancy vehicles, and we know we shouldn't, especially when it comes to inner city or long distance travel. What we really need is a culture change to get people out of cars. And that's really the subject of the two upcoming Zoom calls, one today and one next week, Thursday. Uh, we'll, we'll post that link so you can register for that on the topic of reducing vehicle miles traveled. Because let's be honest, just moving to electric single passenger vehicles is not going to cut it. It's not going to reduce our air quality needs, which, as you see from my background, uh, we are coordinating this program with California Clean Air Day. It happened on Wednesday uh, with our partners from the Coalition for Clean Air. Shout out to Brian. And we encourage everyone to help pledge to clean the air. And I'm going to post that link in the chat. You can do everything from switching out your filters to walking more a little bit every day to putting solar on your roof, um, which, uh, which is one of the things I, I was able to do this year. So. I also want to let people know that this is part of a larger effort at Move LA. We've been working on since we were founded from supporting Measure R in 2008 and Measure M in 2016 to fund high quality, fast, frequent, and reliable transit in LA County, defending SB1 funding in 2018 with the No on Proposition 8 campaign, and then also to our Climate and Clean Air Initiative, uh, where we've had several Zooms talking about battery technology, hydrogen technology, the scourge of diesel. Uh, amongst uh, short-lived climate pollutants. I mean, we've got a whole series. You can check it out on our uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, which I'll also post in the chat. Um, it just talks about all the different uh, opportunities we have in the state and the state of the challenge that we have to get to a cleaner transportation system. Hi, I'm Assembly Member Laura Friedman. I want to thank you, Move LA, for inviting me to make introductory remarks at today's panel. I want to start by thanking you for all of your advocacy and the way that you are reshaping LA's transportation landscape. Because of your work on Measure R and Measure M, we now have a $160 billion investment in LA Transit. Because of your work, our city is making the investments that we need to build high quality transit across our region. The foremost crisis on our planet is climate change. California has been a national leader in GHG reductions in the energy field, however, 40% of our state's GHG emissions come from the transportation sector. 
Now, our governor has set incredible goals of requiring single occupancy vehicles to be zero emission by 2035. Electrification, of course, will help reduce GHGs, but as you and I firmly believe, if we're really going to tackle global warming in this state and in our country, then we need to focus on a mode shift, not just to electric cars, but to public transportation. That mode shift will require making our roads safer and building sustainable communities where everything that we need, work, school, groceries, and entertainment are within a 15 minute travel distance by walking, biking, and by public transit. This year, I authored legislation to require cities to remove parking minimums by high quality transit and to reform our sustainable community strategies to build healthier cities. These efforts have stalled and I'll need help from organizations like yours to help make our leaders recognize the importance of land use policies on transportation. If we're gonna push people into transit, then we need to make it safer for people to walk and bike to transit. We also need to make that transit itself pleasant and safe. Now that's why I authored AB 43, which will allow cities to set safe speed limits and joint authored AB 122 and AB 1238, which will decriminalize normal walking and biking behavior when it's safe to do so. I think that medium distance travel in Los Angeles can be better met by improving connections between existing systems and ensuring that those run as smoothly as possible. Because it's unlikely that high-speed rail is coming to, NA, and to LA anytime in the near future, although of course I do hope it does come here, I'm very focused on improving transit in our region. Consistent with that, and as part of the budget negotiations around high-speed rail this year, I requested an additional $3 billion of general fund uh, funding for transit projects in and around Los Angeles. This amount was to be in addition to the $1 billion general fund proposed in the May revise for 2028, and that's for Olympics related transit. This money could be used to fund projects that reduce congestion and also VMT, such as by working on the Sepulveda Pass project to finally get that going and investments to improve the LA Metro Orange Line. Additional funding could also be used to pay for critical grade separations and rail crossings that would increase the safety and reliability of our rail lines. We also need to improve access to airports. We often joke in LA that if a friend asks to pick you up at Burbank Airport, they owe you a coffee. But if they offer to pick you up at LAX, uh, they owe you first month's rent. Because of Measure M, the city is finally making investments in mass transit to LAX with the People Mover, and I can't wait to see that in action. I love seeing it under construction. The additional $3 billion could help projects like the Inglewood Transit Connector that will connect communities of color in Inglewood to LAX and the rest of the city to the SoFi Stadium and the future Clippers Arena. We can't get riders to shift to buses and trains for long distance travels if cities do not have adequate public transit for local travel. Reducing our reliance on single occupancy vehicles in car dependent Los Angeles is gonna be difficult work. And it's something that's going to require tackling from many angles. Real transit investments in Los Angeles will allow us to truly help reduce our dependency on automobiles and make for smarter land use and build more housing. I look forward to continuing to work with groups like Move LA and pushing for more transit investments in Los Angeles and continuing discussions with the governor to make sure that Los Angeles is not left out as we continue to build public transportation across the state. Thanks again, Move LA. We will uh, kick it over first by starting with Darwin um, uh, Musavi. He is, I hope I said that right, uh, the Secretary for Environmental Policy and Housing Coordination at California State Transportation uh, Agency. I'll post his bio in the chat. You can read all his accomplishments, as well as uh, you may hear his one-year-old uh, in, in the background. I consider that an accomplishment too. Darwin has been tasked with helping to align transportation spending with the state's climate change scoping plan. This means CalSTA's investments must support smart growth, to reduce VMT and increase the production of infill housing. Reduce congestion by encouraging a reduction in driving and by investing in walking, biking, and transit and building an integrated transit network statewide, which is really gonna be uh, the focus for today. And I'm really excited actually, uh, Move LA is rejoining the board of Climate uh, Climate Plan, which is a statewide advocacy organization. I know Naila is probably gonna be joining uh, uh, 
us later, uh, but we're going to be joining that organization. And one of the main agencies we're going to be working with, um, and I know already Naila has been working with Darwin, uh, is CalSTA. So very excited to be doing that work. And uh, I'll kick it over to you. Go for it, Darwin. You're on. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Eli, for that introduction. Can you hear me OK? All right, perfect. Um, and yeah, apologies ahead of time if you also uh, hear my guest speaker, my one-year-old in the background at, at some point, but um, gr great to be here with you all today. As Eli mentioned, I'm Darwin Musavi. I'm the Deputy for Environmental Policy and Housing Coordination at uh, CALSTA, the State Transportation Agency. Um, for those of you uh, uh, not familiar with CALSTA, we're a, a um, large uh, state agency uh, that oversees uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, CHP, Caltrans, um, the California Transportation uh, Commission, the High Speed Rail Authority, and, and um, others um, here at the state. Um, and I just wanted to, to, to start off, um, I'm going to give a brief presentation on our Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure that, that Eli mentioned that I've been working on. Before I, but before I do that, I wanted to do a little bit of setting the stage, kind of building on what, what Eli was talking about um, earlier. I wanted to, I guess, first start off by highlighting a major item that got major media attention a few months ago um, and is very much related to this conversation. Um, many of you might be aware of the recent report um, by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on climate change. This report was uh, looked at the science of climate change and was the first one of its kind since 2013. And I must say it was a, a rather sobering report um, and kind of put in, um, uh, you know, on paper what a lot of us have been sensing in terms of, of where we're headed. Um, and every scenario that was analyzed in this report concluded that it'd be very difficult to limit global warming by 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, which is what all the nations committed to in the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and the report says there will be even greater increases in global temperatures unless drastic actions are taken to substantially reduce GHGs as soon as possible. Uh, the UN Secretary General went as far as to call the report code red for humanity. Um, and I don't want to, you know, um, be all doom and gloom this morning. Um, there was definitely some hope um, um, in the report. The report did talk about how there's a chance to avoid even more catastrophic outcomes if we can curb emissions boldly and quickly. Um, and uh, that means uh, our collective efforts to reduce emissions and transportation in particular are even more urgent than ever. Um, I think you know, because of all this, it, it's, it's very timely that we at CalSTA, after two years of extensive conversation and dialogue with, with partners that included many of you, adopted our climate action plan for transportation infrastructure this past July. Um, and that is now available on our website. Um, CAPDI, as we call it, is a paradigm shift for transportation planning in California, but I think a timely and necessary one. Um, as I meant, as Eli mentioned, transportation emissions in California make up over half of our greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Um, and history tells us that zero emission vehicles alone are not going to get us where we need to go. The continuing trend of, of increased driving and VMT in California has in the past you know, undermined our, our uh, clean vehicle progress. And you know, there's no sign that shows that that won't happen unless we put a big uh, focus on VMT moving in the future. And we simply cannot adopt ZEVs at a high enough rate fast enough um, without also curbing vehicle travel to meet our goals because time is of the essence um, um, as the report laid out. Um, and that's why rail and transit play such a critical role in meeting our climate goals, uh, not to mention, you know, the other benefits of public health and equity, which are very much also centered to achieving the outcomes that the uh, central to achieving the outcomes of the state um, desires. So with that, I want to give a quick presentation on, on CAPDI um, to provide uh, additional background for you all on this latest effort. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, all right, hopefully you all can see that. So the, the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure that we adopted um, 
was our implementation document for the governor's executive order in 1919, which came out in September of 2019. And this executive order asked um, our agency to leverage state transportation spending to help meet climate change goals. In particular, as you can see with the bullets here, it specifically asked us to focus on doing so by investing um, uh, in ways that we can reduce vehicle miles traveled. And that includes not only supporting infill development um, um, through our transportation decisions, making transportation decisions that support the right type of development we need to have um, uh, kind of low transportation impact communities, uh, but also investing those dollars um, in, in modes that encourage an alternative to driving and transit use and walking and biking. Um, and, and for um, reducing congestion, you know, move away from our traditional methods um, that have included you know, um, highway widenings that we know now induce additional vehicle travel, um, but instead to um, providing people with, with opportunities to opt out of that congestion and then having innovative strategies to manage that congestion. Um, and to obviously do all of this while thinking about transportation costs on lower income Californians, which is um, key to making sure that we um, provide an equitable transportation system for Californians. So specifically the executive order called out um, uh, $5 billion of transportation um, infrastructure funding. And that $5 billion is made up of various statewide competitive and discretionary grant programs mentioned here. I won't get into the details of these programs, but um, several of these programs, um, I would say, are already working working hard towards um, the goals of the executive order um, mentioned. Um, others, we've provided recommendations in the plan of how to better align with, with the goals of CAPDI. So CAPDI is a holistic framework for aligning state transportation infrastructure with our state climate health and social equity goals and is built on the existing foundation. Fix it first um, uh, approach established in, in Senate Bill 1, which um, passed in 2017 and, and brought us additional gas tax revenue in the state. So what this means is, is um, our, our document is not saying let's wholesale go in and, and um, shift where the dollars um, go and, and, and uh, where they go, but looking at each of these different programs and making changes to prioritize projects, the best projects that are competitive with, within each of those projects that help meet, meet our goals. There's a lot of flexibility within our um, current transportation funding framework at the state to allow us to um, align our dollars um, with our values. And that's exactly what we're hoping to do. So this document provides a suite of proposed changes to state transportation planning, programming, and mitigation to align with what we're calling the CAPDI framework. And we're doing all of this uh, while keeping in mind the need to make sure that all areas of the state benefit from any changes we make, um, um, and that this doesn't, you know, result in in um, changing the geographic distribution of funds, but instead raising the the um, best projects in each region um, across the state. So the document lays out um, an investment framework made up of 10 guiding principles, as well as eight specific strategies that include over 30 actions of specific initial work to help align our work with those guiding principles. I'm not gonna get into the strategies and actions here today, but just wanted to give you a sense of what those guiding principles are and, and what it really you know, is that we're, we're saying we need to invest our transportation dollars at the state on. Um, the 10 principles include kind of three areas, main areas of investment, um, as you see here. Um, uh, we specifically, um, first and foremost, call out building towards an integrated statewide rail and transit network. And that is um, a key component um, uh, of what we think we need to be investing in in the future. Um, we also need to be investing in networks of safe and bicycle pedestrian infrastructure to support that rail and transit network. And then um, our investments, um, um, we acknowledge that with those investments, you know, we're still going to have plenty of driving in the state, even if we have a robust um, rail and transit network that's connected and integrated throughout the state. And so we need to make sure that we're including investments in light, medium, and heavy duty zero emission vehicle infrastructure 
as part of larger corridor projects in our state highway system. Um, and as we make these investments, we have seven other guiding principles that, that um, provide us with, with um, direction on how to make sure those investments are, are bringing the equity and public health benefits that, that we need. So um, we, we call out the need of making sure that our projects are uh, maximizing on community benefits, and working with communities to make sure that that's happening. Um, we need to focus our safety efforts on uh, Vision Zero and specifically on reducing fatalities and severe injuries instead of, I think, historically we've taken a general approach about um, reduction around collisions um, instead of um, thinking about our vulnerable road users and all users um, uh, and making sure that we're reducing uh, fatalities and injuries. Uh, as we build projects, we can't just be thinking about reducing emissions. We need to be thinking about physical climate risk and the and the um, uh, threat of climate change, which is already here, and integrating that into our projects. Um, we are are um, moving forward, going to be promoting projects that do not increase significant passenger vehicle travel, um, and so you know that means being mindful of projects that induce. Um, additional additional VMT. Um, we're gonna we want to promote projects that support and fill development and provide an opportunity for the right type of development to surround the transportation infrastructure. We've historically um, thought of transportation as something that follows infrastructure uh, follows land use development, but I think you know it's important to recognize that transportation decisions uh, do very much impact the type of development that can follow. Um, uh, and the flip side of that is we need to make sure we're protecting our natural and working lands um, um, in our transportation decisions and not uh, implementing transportation solutions that have the ability to encourage additional sprawl and, and um, uh, eat into those um, key natural and working lands that are needed for carbon sequestration. And finally, we're also working on developing the zero emission freight transportation system holistically as we think about our projects. Um, which I think will be key from a goods movement perspective as we make these shifts. So this, this plan and this guidance document that will be uh, driving our decision-making moving forward, as I said, was adopted. Um, uh, the California Transportation Commission passed a resolution of support for it in August, and we've already begun implementation. Uh, we'll be giving updates, um, uh, public uh, annual reports on this, um, every fall in terms of the progress we've made on implementing the document, um, uh, as well as uh, have many of opportunities for public engagement between now and then. Um, and then before I conclude, I wanted to um, also highlight that as part of this, this direction, you know, we're, we're building off of existing pieces of work that we've already committed to, um, uh, you know, the statement about and our commitment to building out a, a state rail network is not new. We're, we're, we've been working on implementing the California State Rail Plan, which we um, completed in 2018, and that's still very much part of our vision. Um, the 2040 vision laid out in the State Rail Plan um, envisions high speed inner city and regional train services that connect. Um, to hubs to enable smooth transfers to the local transit and rail network. And the 2040 vision will extend the benefits of high-speed rail and multimodal connectivity to residents across the state. And that's a key, key component is to reach as much of the state as possible. So I just wanted to provide all of this background because I think it's, it's um, important background to the conversation about you know, um, what types of investments we need to be making and how uh, we need to be thinking about um, the future, particularly as we talk about these um, long and, and medium length trips and how we connect our regions across the state. So with that, I will um, find a way to stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Eli. Awesome. Thank you so much, Darwin. Um, uh, I wanted to kind of Focus a little bit on the the equity piece. You know, I, I, there's uh, I was reading a lot last night about super commuters. You know, and how particularly in the Bay Area, you know, you have 
uh, people who are who are commuting more than an hour and a half every single day. And typically those tend to be, or they're, they're people who can't afford obviously to live in, in San Francisco, which is pretty much all of us. It's especially acute for those people who are like nurses, for instance, uh, actually my sister and my, uh, my aunt are both nurses and where do they live? In the less expensive East Bay area. Um, and, you know, and other workers who work in, in lower income industries. So I guess I'm just wondering, like, especially for those super commuters, but also for thinking about it from an equity lens, like, how can we help those folks? Because every, you know, every time you take, you know, here in Southern California, and we'll talk about this with Jeff, Jeffrey Dunn about some of their numbers, you know, every time you take one of these super commuters off the road and put them on transit, you're, you're getting a bigger bang for your buck, right? And I said earlier, you know, every... Per capita per day, we need to reduce vehicle miles traveled by 2.9 uh, miles, which, you know, I mean, some people are going to reduce by 30 miles, some are going to reduce by half a mile. Um, how would you kind of, how would you say the state is kind of focusing resources in that direction? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very um, uh, huge and challenging issue that we have, right? We, and I think the way I like to think about it is, um, we often focus on housing affordability, but um, the true kind of um, total package and burden on households across the state um, about where they live is a housing and transportation cost burden, right? Like you're, you're not just paying for, for housing, you're also paying for transportation and where you live very much dictates how much you pay for transportation. So, you know, what we have right now is, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of super commuters who uh, may be priced out of more um, expensive um, areas and, and therefore choosing to live further away, but because of the lack of transportation options um, are also having a high price tag for, for transportation and the amount of gas that they're, they're spending to, to make those long commutes and the need for multiple vehicles in a household because everyone's relying on a car. Um, um, and, you know, and those are pretty significant price tags. Um, I, the way I like to think about this is if we make investments in, in, in a regional um, transportation specifically focused at those kind of long, long trips, um, you know, while we're simultaneously working on reducing um, or improving housing affordability in urbanized regions, can we at least take a part of their cost burden away and, and reduce their transportation cost burden by providing um, cheaper alternatives um, uh, for people who go longer distances. In terms of you know how you do that and how you do that effectively, I mean I think the um, the 2018 rail plan um, provides a great um, blueprint for that. I think it's not just about building out a connected network, but one that connects to local networks. Um, if someone gets on a train to get somewhere and they get off on the other end and they have no way to get to their last their last mile destination, which sometimes may be when we're talking about long trips, multiple yeah. miles, if not dozens of miles, um, you know, we have a big problem. So um, the, the local, yeah, the local, the local network is, you know, uh, just as important. Um, and that local connectivity is just as important to be able to make these long trips happen. And then integration between services um, um, you know, it's, uh, for transportation planners, you know, it's kind of nothing new here in terms of you need, you need reliability, you need affordability, you need the, the um, uh, connectivity and integration um, and quality service um, to, to make it happen. But I think uh, for us, a big step is seeing how we can support um, projects that do all of those things by, um, you know, trying to prioritize these types of projects with our funding. We've we put plans together for years, but we haven't made this, you know, our top priority in terms of where we put our dollars up to be recently. Uh, awesome. Real quick before we uh, we uh, talk switch to talk about high speed rail, um, is there are there like checkpoints with the CAPTA implementation? Like, is it going to adapt? Uh, this is a question from Steve in the in the chat. Are there you know are you going to every four years come back and say okay we're shifting it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, we hope to put out, as I mentioned, an annual progress report every year. And I think that will give us a chance to, um, to pivot and, and rethink anything that's not working, particularly from an actions perspective. Like if we've taken up an action that, that 
um, uh, is a dead end or it proves to not be the right action or if there's new actions that make the most sense to implement the framework, we'll do that kind of on an, on an annual basis through a public process um, uh, through that annual report. In terms of the overall framework, you know, I think um, the framework we've laid out is pretty consistent with, I think, the direction the federal government is going in. I think it will be kind of um, the priorities of investments for a while to come. Um, so we don't have any um, immediate um, plans to update the framework itself. Obviously, um, you know, we work in an ever-changing environment. So if there's a need at a certain point, we'll evaluate that. But uh, certainly want to keep tweaking how we approach implementing it and we'll keep making changes. Rock on. Okay. And we are, uh, we're going to keep, we're going to, we're going to keep on you. Um, <laughs> don't worry. Folks, uh, us and climate plan are going to make sure we'll be there at every step of the way. Um, we're also really going to push on the idea of like, where's the money going to come from? You know, cause the state legislature either really needs to step up in a big way. Uh, you know, we're kind of waiting and we'll talk about that. I think a little bit more towards the end like all the federal money as well. Um, but we also think that, you know, Californians are itching for solutions and we'll fund those solutions as well. So uh, we, we've been looking at uh, the idea of a statewide pilot initiative uh, that we've tentatively called Climate and Clean Air Initiative um, uh, to, to basically fund, you know, shifts in modalities uh, throughout the state. Uh, let me, uh, I want to move on to uh, our next speaker, uh, LaDonna DeCamillo. You may have seen that my background uh, got changed. And the reason is uh, we, uh, my family and I, this is my family uh, on the Amtrak uh, uh, in Santa Barbara uh, over the summer. So we took a trip um, on Amtrak uh, down the coast from San Francisco. Actually, we wanted to go from Portland all the way to LA. We couldn't because of that bridge outage, uh, which talks about, you know, speaks to the fragility of the system uh, that happened because of the fires uh, also caused by climate uh, changes uh, in the Oregon, California border. We did San Francisco to Los Angeles, and you know, it was a beautiful trip, as you can see, a beautiful coast. It was also a slow trip. It took uh, 12 hours in total, and we split it up because I've got pretty young kids, so 12 hours on a train would have been uh, probably insanity. Um, we stopped in slow and stayed a day or two, but, you know, one of the challenges that we found, not only because it was that was slow because you know, we didn't have a car with us. And in San Francisco, we were like, okay, how are we going to get to the train station? And I was like, all right, we're going to do this all on transit as best we can. You know, five of us, a bunch of bags, four year old in tow. And we were able to figure out how to, we were able to figure out how to go from our hotel, which is in Fisherman's Wharf, on a trolley to, uh, they're actually running ferry service now in San Francisco across the bay. So we hopped on that and then walk the four kind of not so great blocks between the ferry terminal and the Amtrak station, uh, we're able to get there. Um, but, you know, it speaks to this idea of, you know, interconnectivity. And, and also, you know, I mean, I, I just want to harken back to kind of that vote that we all took as voters in 2008 for high-speed rail and sort of vision of, of the ability to get across the state uh, very quickly. You know, I would love to visit my sister, as I said, in the Bay Area, up at uh, El Cerrito, and get there in three hours and not have to take a plane or not have to drive. So you know, I, that's why we wanted to hear a little bit and get an update on uh, high-speed rail. LaDonna is here with us. She's the Southern California Regional Director. Um, and she's gonna, uh, before that, she was a, a vice president uh, at, over at BNSF. So she understands transportation deeply. Um, and she's gonna talk about the state of high-speed rail and then where we are. Um, but also just want to point people to a great spur report. Uh, I found this on the web for high speed rail. I'll post the link. It talked about, you know, how high speed rail is going to radically shorten travel time between key population centers um, and create a more unified state economy. And there's this great graphic in the report. You should check it out where it sort of squishes the state uh, in a sense because of those travel times. So I really encourage you. Spur is one of our area partners and I encourage you to check out that report. Uh, LaDonna. Great, thanks Eli. And Marissa's gonna run my PowerPoint. I, I didn't wanna rely on myself to be technology savvy. So it looks like she's got it up, but thanks for the introduction. And yeah, I, I come to the authority after 30 years with BNSF and I'm really excited to be here. I think this is a, a really exciting opportunity, a project that California needs and I'm just really happy to be a part of it. So um, first slide, 
uh, Marissa, if you switch slides, really is a reminder, as Eli said, we were, we, we were a bit of an idea until um, Prop 1A made us uh, official in 2008. And the voters voted to uh, move forward with about a $10 billion bond for high-speed rail to increase mobility, needed, provide a needed uh, ground alternative, better air quality and jobs. The next slide, um, you can see we're divided into two phases. The dark blue is phase one. Um, Prop 1A mandates that we make the trip between San Francisco and Los Angeles, Anaheim in a, a two hour and 40 minute. Uh, we're, we're designing for two hours and 40 minutes. So that's really exciting. Um, our phase one is 520 miles. We do have some under construction and I'll cover that in just a bit. And then phase two would extend um, in the yellow from Merced north to Sacramento and from Los Angeles down to San Diego. So the next slide. Um, we're divided into three regions. I am the Southern California Regional Director. My region starts in Bakersfield and goes south. And that region has been subdivided into four different project sections. So for purposes of environmental study, we've divided into these four sections from Bakersfield to Palmdale, Palmdale to Burbank, Burbank to Los Angeles, and Los Angeles to Anaheim. And then you can see from this map that we interconnect with Brightline, who you're going to hear from soon. Um, that's the green line. And uh, we're actually really excited about uh, we put in a raised grant application to do some study in Palmdale to design the Palmdale station um, to, to accommodate high speed rail, um, Brightline, Metrolink, and do some design around that. So a um, little bit more on, on our station design planning. Uh, but we are excited about those opportunities. I'm only going to talk about one of the sections really today, and that's the next slide. And, and I'm going to talk about uh, Burbank to Los Angeles. And the reason I pulled this one out um, is because our final environmental document is scheduled to be published sometime in November, and we're, we're still on target to get it to our board in January. So that's really exciting. And this section, um, we just finished actually Bakersfield to Palmdale in August and um, got our environmental clearance there. So we get to start that next phase. And then we're working on the environmental clearance for this 14 mile section. This would connect the Burbank airport with a, a terminal right outside or a station right outside the new terminal that they've proposed and then take passengers into Union Station. So we're excited about this particular section that should be to our board in January. Uh, the next slide, I, I promised to talk a little bit about what's under construction. We have 119 miles currently under construction from just north of Bakersfield up to Madera. We, um, we are hoping to continue that construction with funds from uh, the legislature for the remaining Prop 1A funds. Only about half of, of the funds have currently been allocated. So in the dark red here, you can see um, 119 miles under construction. And then the hash marks is what is, uh, for the most part, environmentally cleared. So we've, we've on, our, on our alignment for phase one, we've got about 300 miles environmentally cleared um, and we're ready to move on to the next phases. The next slide talks a little bit about um, our construction jobs. We have a partnership with the Building Trades. We love the trades uh, and have created over 6,000 jobs, um, a little over a thousand workers a day that we're calling out from the trades. We, we put a partnership in place to train some. Um, they're predominantly from the local area and, and we're very proud of that. Uh, we also have a program, uh, an, uh, an aggressive program to recruit and incorporate small businesses. Uh, and to date, we've, in, we've employed 628 small businesses. Um, and you can see the breakdown of disadvantaged businesses and so forth. Um, so we're proud of that program. And then we are committed to 100% renewable electric energy. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about our sustainability initiatives as we move forward. So the next slide is kind of a summary of where we are as high-speed rail delivering um, zero emission miles. So in 50 years of operation, we've estimated we will reduce 102 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. Um, we'll, we'll reduce about 3 million flights and 200, over 280 billion uh, 
vehicle miles traveled. So that's in about 50 million or 50 years of operation. Uh, next slide, really exciting. We have a team that's working on station design. And um, since there's an opportunity as we go into stations, um, cities with stations, and we're kind of limited in to how many stations that we can have because uh, we, we want to keep our, our travel time as the voters wanted it. But when we do go into a station, we're working with, with cities to, to try to eliminate uh, or, or reduce some of the, the miscellaneous last miles that, that Eli talked about. So, so putting homes next to transit, shopping, doctor's office, um, and, and this kind of depicts um, what, what our goals are. So like I said, um, around the Palmdale station, we're gonna be do, doing just some design work. I know they're doing some design in Fresno, um, but this is part of our program as we move forward. So my next slide just kind of summarizes where we're at from uh, sustainability standards, reducing carbon dioxide. As I said, we have six, over 6,000 workers dispatched, um, many from disadvantaged communities. In the lower left, uh, we, we have a pretty aggressive program in requiring our construction contractors to, uh, to use zero emission vehicles. So we're setting some new standards in construction as we bid out these packages um, to, to try to reduce emissions that are associated with our construction. And we're really excited about that. And then, like I said, we're, we're committed to that 100% renewable electric. Next slide is a summary just of, if, if you could imagine if we were a typical diesel fleet versus an electric fleet um, across the board, we'll see environmental improvements wow. uh, from operating at electric high-speed rail. Um, and then I like these next two slides. Um, a lot of people talk about, well, is the, you know, there's a lot of money in this investment. Well, there's also a lot of savings. Um, Darwin touched on you know, trying to reduce vehicle miles traveled and, and we as a state continue to put money into the highway system. Uh, if we can put money into rail, we'll be reducing over 4,000 lane miles. Um, 91 gates in, in different flights for what we estimate a cost of 153 billion. So if you move to the next slide, you can see kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. There is the range for our construction between 63 billion and 98 billion, but there's also a range if, if we were to, to build that equivalent highway air capacity. And you can see that there's a cost to that as well. So we think that we are uh, an efficient, sustainable option for um, reducing vehicle miles and freeways. Uh, and, and I think the younger generation I have behind me, I will ride, I'm gonna put a little plug in for our I will ride team. We have a program that's reaching out to um, colleges, not just for people to ride, but for the next generation of engineers and, and employees to get, to get the, their feedback on what they're looking for and just really engage them in our program. So I'm excited about that program. And then I'll just finish up with stay in touch with us. The last slide on um, this particular slides for our Los Angeles to Anaheim section, but at, excuse me, at hsr.ca.gov, you can stay in touch with what's going on. Awesome. So I'm going to pause there and let Eli yeah, grab some water for sure. And you, I love that. I mean, my kids love train travel. I mean, they, it gets them so excited. I remember this video of my two-year-old a couple of years ago with the train going by and him just going, choo, choo. it's the cutest thing. Um, but yeah, it is about this culture change in this next generation. And also, I mean, this really speaks to that, those last slides speak to why CAPTI is so important, right? Darwin is, you know, we have to think about like our investments, like our investments aren't limited, are, are, aren't unlimited, right? We have to decide whether we're going to spend money on a highway project or on a long distance uh, rail project and looking at the numbers the value of how much sort of return you get on our investment is something that I don't think governments do very well, but we really as advocates need to be doing that. The other thing that I really love about this project is the co-benefits. And we always forget to talk about that as transit advocates, right? Jobs now, right? I mean, those are good paying, high quality jobs uh, with benefits with our partners at the building trades. People are getting employed in the Central Valley, which always lacks enough jobs. 
right now. So you know, a lot of people talk about, well, oh, I'm never going to ride that train. Um, you know, what is the benefit to me? The benefit is a, is a stronger state economy because we have people with jobs. I love that you have that slide on air quality and trying to push on that now because that's another value, right? Every, you know, if people continue to, even if they're using their electric vehicle to drive across the state and, you know, we know like there's great new technologies that can get you from LA to San Francisco without a charge, you're still using brakes, you still have tires that are wearing and creating air quality problems that these types of travel will not. Obviously the greenhouse gas benefits, but also the tra traffic benefits. And then the land use benefits, I totally forgot about that. And I was reading, you know, I'm, I'm meeting next week with the folks from um, Encho Cucamonga about their intermodal transit center. And I think you know, Brightline as well is gonna connect in there. Um, but like, how do we, like, how can we use um, these to shift land use so that yes, people are not um, using, you know, using less uh, single occupancy vehicles, SOVs to, to shift. Um, hope you've gotten your voice back. I just wanted to know, yeah, is that Denny? No, I said, I hope I have my voice back. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I heard Denny. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, what do you kind of see as necessary you know, I'm talking a little bit uh, about like psychology. I know that many of us are sort of transit planners. Um, how do we convince people to get out of their cars and, and uh, shift their modes and that, you know, it isn't all about a big house and a fancy car that they can, you know, they can, we can shift this conversation away from highway expansion and reducing traffic. And, and you know, Ladani, you can answer that. But Darwin, if you wanted to jump in as well, if you had any thoughts. Yeah, and I may, I may punt a bit to Darwin. Um, he talked about the state rail plan and I didn't touch too much, but we are integrating with Metrolink and trying to design for um, more Metrolink, Losan, Amtrak. We'll all share from Burbank South, we'll all pretty much share um, that corridor and we're, we're designing it and building it out for the, the, the future rail in California. And I think what's really important for, for riders is the dependability and the frequency of the ride. And if we can put enough frequency in that corridor um, for, for games, you know, if somebody wants to go to a sporting event or, a, or um, a concert, there needs to be a late night option, right, for you to take the train. So um, that's really what we're designing to. And it, it won't just be for high-speed rail, but it, it will be for our partners as well to be able to use that corridor. And Darwin may want to add some more to that. Right, right. And I think you were talking about, you know, how can we get five-minute headways from, from Burbank to LA? And that could be significant. Um, yeah. Did you want to add anything? Sure. I mean, I'll just say that, you know, I think you know, obviously how we pay for a lot of this stuff, you know, we can talk about that and that's the big, big question, but putting that aside and assuming you have the funds to make this stuff a reality, I, I, I feel like there's been this overblown question about like, you know, how do we convince people to, to use this stuff? Um, well, if you were to build it and you actually have it competitive with the automobile, like, I don't think that question is a serious one anymore. It's really about, you know, people um, are at the end of the day, just trying to pick the most efficient, cost-effective way to get from point A to point B. And if we can get to a point where rail and transit compete um, in, in this state, I think you'd see, you know, major um, uh, shift in travel mode and behavior, um, you know, how to get there without having um, uh, the funds and the support and the belief that um, we can get there is obviously a good and challenging question to, to talk about. But, um, you know, I think if, if um, the, the system were to be there, um, um, we'd be surprised that even, even in the state of California with um, um, our, our love of vehicles, uh, that people would make the, the economical and cost uh, time and cost effective choice for themselves um, in terms of how they get around. Well, and I think too, I, you know, that, that psychology is so important. And, you know, I, I, I posted a link to Streets blog um, uh, post and they have been critical of the project. I'll, I'll you know, we have to admit. Um, but the editors from San Francisco and LA went to the Central Valley to check it out, and they were sort of the, the 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 sense that I got from the article was they were like, "Wow, stuff being built, and it's impressive, and it's 
big and it's, you know, it, it's happening. This isn't just a, you know, something that we hear about in public meetings or in the news, like there's physical infrastructure on the ground and it's being built as we speak. And, and I think people don't really recognize that because they're not driving past it kind of every single day. So, great. Well, let's, uh, I'm, uh, if it's okay, we're, uh, I'm, let's, uh, let's kick it over to, um, uh, we're gonna have a conversation now about a different mode of transit. Uh, buses. Uh, so we're really uh, honored and excited to have uh, Pierre Gourdain, uh, the Senior Managing Director for Flixbus in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and, you know, obviously traveling by buses, and we've been huge proponents of increasing bus service, particularly intra-city bus service here in Los Angeles, um, is a climate-friendly way to get around. And Flixbus operates a bus fleet on uh, their uh, Pierre will talk about what their what their fuel sources are and how they're moving towards cleaner fuel, um, as well as making it integrated with the system with the uh, racks and such. Uh, but they're the number one ground based long distance mobility provider in the US and have transported more than a million passengers since they launched on the West Coast in 2018, probably higher now. Um, I'm going to post a great article from Fast Company, where I called it a world changing idea that came out of Europe, actually. Um, and Talked about how bus could replace short haul flights or taking a personal car for intercity transit. And so um, you know, we think that it's a, an exciting kind of opportunity and wanted to wanted to hear from a private operator too. We think that this integration, and there was a great map that uh, LaDonna showed integrating the private operator Brightline with the public operator High Speed Rail. So uh, Pierre, I'll, I'll kick it over to you and, and to talk a little bit about what you're working on. Thank you so much, Eli. Uh, thanks everyone. Big shout out to MoveLA and the great work we're doing to, to showcase new mobilities and, and great ideas. It's, it feels really good to be among kind of spirits today and, and to discuss alternatives to car. I think we, we all share the same vision here. Uh, you are not making my, 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 my work easy by, by putting me after the high speed way trans uh, presentation because it's, it's on such a larger scale. Uh, and uh, also a like, big shout out to, to the high-speed uh, rail uh, team. It's what you guys are doing is amazing. Maybe by way of introducing myself, I've been working in transportation for the past 15 years now. Uh, my first job, I was actually, and this explains my accent and apologies in advance if sometimes I'm not super clear, don't hesitate to just ask me to repeat myself. Um, my first job, I was advising the French okay. Minister of Transport in the late, late teens in, in France. And uh, I was actually working on, on two high-speed uh, train projects at the time uh, to Marseille and Bordeaux, about the same distance as LA to San Francisco, uh, much smaller cities on the receiving end. And I got to see a lot of studies that were made at the time across all Europe, across Asia. And, and I think the main takeaway here is that in transport, supply, if it's well built, creates its own demand. And uh, that's really the main takeaway. If you build it, they will come. If you build it right, they will come. And of course, if you, you need to price it right as well. And in a way, the Flixbus story is a, is a bit of a good case in point here, although we are much smaller. And this is why it feels uh, hard to, to come after the high-speed train. And even before white line, we are a bit like between a, a high-speed train and a, and a hard place here with our little bus network. Um, we, but I think we, we managed to demonstrate that if you build the right service, if you price it at the right price point, people will come and you can really build something big. We started less than 10 years ago. It's a very unique story. Uh, Flixbus today in, in Europe is really a household brand in tens of countries, going to close to 3,000 destinations, more than 100 million passengers since launch. We do buses, of course, but we also do trains. And we are a household brand in Europe and now in more and more cities as well in the, as well in the US, also a household brand. Um, how do we do this? The secret is that we decided to not operate any bus, nor any train. Uh, what we do is that we go where the knowledge is and we partner with local operators, which really allows us to create a lot of efficient efficiencies. And Flixbus is a brand uh, platform, of course, but also a very uh, full stack technological platform. We support our partners who launch those routes. It functions a little bit like a, 
a little bit like a franchisee system, if you want. So we work with tens of small and medium uh, sized businesses across this great set of California, across all of the US, across all of Europe, who basically go out, buy a bus, wrap it in the flips bus crawler, agree on a common standard that is a very high standard, and then we'll operate a route that we agree upon. All we do is we help in the network planning, we help price it, we help market those tickets. And of course, we, we let them use this Flixbus brand. We are all co-custodians of this brand and try to, together to create a great experience. It, it sounds easy like that, but when you look, when you double click for a second on it, it's actually super complex. And this is why tens of companies have tried what we do and very few have succeeded. We have uh, just a network to give you an idea. The largest uh, airline in the world is maybe a thousand planes. Flipsbus at its peak, there are more than 2,000 vehicles running in close to 40 countries. Imagine the complexity. And uh, while a plane goes point to point, a bus can stop eight or 10 times in a day in different cities. So much more complexity when it comes to interlining, interpricing. The marketing, same thing. We are just review a, a few little KPIs here. We're bidding on more than 120 million search keywords every day. Uh, we need to price 100 million seats on a daily, on, uh, also on a, uh, every day. And we need to optimize it so that those buses, they can't be empty too much. And of course, the experience needs to be first rate. It needs to be basically, you go on your app, you book your bus, and it, it feels like, I was gonna say booking an Uber, we've been compared a lot to Uber, but in a way, yeah, I think it's a good analogy. The day it's as easy, then you also more people will come. Accessibility is not only about price, it's also about ease of usage. And I think we, we've demonstrated this in the US in a way even more that I, I did start in Europe, my career at Flipsbus for the past four years. I've been in, in California. Um, actually, LA is our home in the US. That's where everything started for us. We've always worked really closely with the CPUC uh, and a lot of institutions in the Bay Area, as well as in, uh, in, the, in, the, LA, uh, in the LA area, where team is really Angeleno. Uh, many locals in, in our LA office and in the Bay Area commuting now a bit less. Uh, since, since launching, we had millions of passengers. We serve more than 300 destinations, hundreds of buses. Uh, we, we started on the, on the West Coast. And the reason we started on the West Coast, I just want to kind of zoom in a little bit here, is that buses is very prevalent in the East Coast. If you look at some relations, um, say New York to Philly, we have close to 15% of the trips between the two cities that are done by bus. On a very comparable relation in Southern California, you have maybe one to 2% between LA and San Diego. People in California are not that different uh, than in Northeast. I mean, we are not weird in, in the way that we just love our cars. And, and our assumption was the, the reason uh, no one is using the bus is just because it doesn't exist. And we're gonna, well, let's just do it. And we found the right partners. Uh, we put it at the right price and we, we launched. And what we saw is that in, in less than three years, we're able to more than triple the volume of people who travel between the two cities by bus, three X in three years. And we are just getting started. And then of course, COVID uh, slowed us down a little bit, but now in the past, actually in the past weeks, we see again, the kind of old growth coming back when universities have reopened. And this is really, again, uh, right price and right service. If you can offer a better service for a lower price, it's really a step change and much, much more people use it. If you ask around, around you in LA, uh, people will say, oh yeah, Flixbus, of course, they take you to San Diego for $8 or $10 or $50 or $20. And more importantly, they really take you very close to home. So we're able to, to basically create the demand that did not exist. And I remember before we launched, everyone was telling me, hey, Forget it, you don't launch in California. It's not gonna work. You don't understand people here. They, um, they, don't, uh, they just won't take the bus. And truth of the matter is they do. Uh, uh, we have, I mean, we have the, we have the case in point. Uh, one thing, uh, we do many things differently. First, of course, the tech is really different. You can locate your bus on the app. You can book super easily. Uh, the price is right. Then we, we have a really, deep multi-stop network, which I think allows us to be much closer to the customer. If, you, if, you, if it takes two hours to get to the stop and $40 by Uber because there's not enough transit, you might have the best service in the world and it's still not gonna work. For instance, that's just in the LA area and that's LA. We have, you can see we have 
eight stops, but we also stopped, for instance, in Lone Beach, in Anaheim, in, uh, in Santa Monica, and, um, and more east. Um, I think in total, we have close to 15 stops in the larger LA metro area. So that gives you a good idea of how, how deep our network is. There's no long distance operator of any type who has as many stops as Flixbus in the LA area. And again, keep in mind, we're just getting started here. We're just getting our in our groove, it's for us, we, it's, it's really long. It's a bit like the long uh, high speed train as well. It's really a long distance. It's a marathon. And we think what you see here, we, we're going to do five or 10 X in the next 10 or 15 years as we, as we grow more and as we convince more people to get out of their cars. Let me just very quickly, I know I'm at the end of my time, uh, focus on our clean air initiative. Uh, unfortunately, there is not a lot of uh, electric buses out there right now. Options are super limited. Basically, there, there are no options, to be honest. So uh, there was one electric bus in, uh, that was built in 2019. And we, as soon as we could, we just put our hand on it and we did a trial, uh, a pilot in San Francisco, not in LA, sadly. And we went to Sacramento to see if the bus would even work. It did work. We did a back and forth. There was enough battery. Uh, and now we are looking at, at the next uh, option, probably either in California or in, uh, or in, the, in probably on the, in the Pacific Northwest as well. Just a small parenthesis here. Uh, as in so many things in transport, the, the name of the game here is collaboration. And in electric, even more, it's really about coalition building. We, we are super going home on it, of course, but, and many of our partners are. But if you want to launch an electric crowd and, and kind of start that avalanche that will basically then go and electrify, the, we hope, the whole network by, the, by 2030 and at least a very more, much more widespread adoption by 2025, we, 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 we need some support from our infra partners, from our station partners, also from local and federal governments. There are a lot of grants that we are kind of discussing and looking into right now, and of course, financial partner. To give you an idea, the electric bus costs twice as much as a, as a normal bus. So it's a million dollars, and the normal bus costs about half a million dollars. So, and it can't uh, drive as much because the diesel bus can drive uh, much, much uh, more, and you just can charge it in a few minutes, while for an electric bus, obviously, it's, it needs to stay in the garage and get charged. So you also need charging partner, infra partner. Of course, it's clean energy, and that's what we are pushing. And just to show you the, the, the number, the good news is that even a normal flex bus, and we have our partners have the newest fleet in the industry, is already less polluting by a factor of seven compared to the car. Uh, electric bus is probably also going zero. Uh, we, we do run electric buses in Europe on two routes. I actually initiated the first electric long distance bus route in the world back when I was in France. Um, and it's been doing great between Paris and Amiens. People are actually ready to even pay more for it. That, again, case point that if you do it, people will come. And, uh, and we also, uh, kind of a side note, we also do run some fixed trains now in, in Europe. Uh, uh, that, that, that's in Germany and in Sweden. We are the fastest growing uh, private train operator in, in all of Europe. It's, it's very niche. I don't think there's any other startup running trains out there. It's, uh, it's also a super interesting uh, venture. And I mean, we're not looking to do it in the, in the US. Our so focus here is really buses. But I thought interesting to mention because there are a lot of train people here. And uh, we've been doing that now for two years. So. Uh, excited to see California go a bit a bit more green. Uh, a final benefit of bus is that it's also a more social, a much more social place. Mm. Um, and and this is I think what, what also makes it more attractive. I love I love your I love your picture, Eli. I think to be memories in a bus or in a train that just don't compare with with what you do in a in a car. It's one we of are, the we, we met yeah. such interesting people on Amtrak. Um, you know, exactly. and have these yeah. conversations, even with masks on and social distancing, you meet mm. you meet interesting people. Yeah, one of the I think one of the biggest one of the last person in American history who made bus cool is Jack Kerouac, and he was he was <laughs> actually saying about LA that it's the the loneliest and and most brutal of all American cities. I think uh, this is definitely not a consequence of climate. I think if there is one defining factor here is that it's a car city. 
And our job is to make it a bit less of a scarcity, make, make it more welcoming to, to everyone. And everyone who uses transit in LA, everyone who bikes in LA, I think, and I mean, I'm proud to be one of them, knows that it's, it's a very uh, friendly, warm, and one of the coolest places to be in, in the world. And I've been to many, so I'm looking forward to take more people out of their cars. That's great. I love it. And I love this graphic. And that's sort of the point of this. It just gets to the heart of the point of why we organized this Zoom was, you know, we really need to invest our dollars in what gets us the most uh, CO2 deductions per, per person, per capita um, in, in our system. And, and bus and obviously rail are a great way to do that. And even, I mean, it would be interesting, as I was saying earlier, you know, on the co-benefits discussion, right, with air quality. I mean, even if you compared it to like an electric vehicle, right, maybe pound for pound, you still get, you know, it's about the same CO2, but you probably get more more efficiencies in terms, you probably get your CO2 reductions uh, just by having multiple people on a bus, but also the air quality reduction um, as well. Um, you know, and, and it's great that you brought up sort of the challenges with battery electric uh, um, coach buses. Um, you know, in, in LA, you know, we have 2,000 or so uh, buses in the, in the metro fleet, and there's a goal to, to go all electric by 2030, and the cost, price tag is going to be $2 billion for the buses and $1.5 for the infrastructure. And those are just intra-city um, rail, and you're right, there are no technologies out there um, for these longer coach distances. I think uh, I was involved years ago with a CalSTA project um, to fund um, a coach bus up in, up in the North counties, Sacramento and above. Um, I think they're trying to pilot something, but it may be, it may, you know, for the public agencies, but it may be better to kind of, you know, have a private agency like yourself kind of figure out, figure it out. Um, this is great. I, I, I think, you know, you know, and you mentioned, you know, people who ride it and love your service. We have uh, one of our attendees, Martha uh, Escobeda, who says, I love to ride Flixbus. Um, so I think that's a good sort of kickoff or, 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 you know, the question that I had, which is about, you know, what can public agencies kind of learn? I mean, I think you talked about integration and good service, but we kind of treat, bus is perceived as a little bit, you know, lower class, right? I mean, I when I was in college, I, my wife, my, my partner uh, at the time was in DC and I was in Philadelphia, you know, and, and, and when I had enough money, I took Amtrak when I didn't, I, I was stuck on Greyhound. Um, and it, it wasn't as nice as Amtrak. How do you kind of flip that script on its head? And really in Southern California, you know, we associate cars as almost a status symbol, right? It's, you know, based on our tastes and our style and our success, even what, what are we using to kind of you know, how can we reface that so that people sort of integrate bus or train or bring a public transit rider into their personalities a little bit more? It's a, it's a very good, very, 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 very good question. I think um, one is, is really plain and simple. It's a bit more of public education around the impact on the, on the environment. I mean, you've been discussing this a lot and I know it's, it, it's, it's close to you, but Cars are, I just, we went from, and the, the weight of a car in the US is multiplied by, by two in the past 50 years, by three in the past, in the past 100 years, that we went from, I don't know, a few thousand units a year to close to 20 million cars sold every year in the US. It's, it's the second largest market in the world. And I think as things go forward, people will just realize that it's, it's one idiotic, uh, because you you lose time, you are separated from other people. You uh, you spend a lot of money on gas, on insurance, on uh, um, just uh, main, maintenance on your car. And uh, one one analogy that someone has been told me recently: it's um, ten or fifteen years ago, smoking was was totally normal, and um, four years ago, maybe five years ago eating meat every day was something totally normal. Uh, 25 years ago, um, hitting your dog was something that was, that was still okay. People would, no one would phone upon you. And even, even in LA or 
in uh, in California uh, 80 years ago, uh, which is two generations, our grandparents. Uh, children working in factories was, in mines, was okay, right? I think uh, we, we forget how quick, and if you would have asked uh, some of, of us around this table, say on even simple things that now seem totally okay, like same-sex marriage 10 years ago, or even say 15 years ago, it's going to happen in the next five years. I think most of us would have said no effing way, right? So uh, I, what we really start to see, and I see it also in our customer feedback, I see it in, because we offer the possibility for people to, um, for people to compensate the carbon emission. So this is kind of a tracker of how important this is for our passengers. We see that in the past two years, there's been a massive change. It's, it's really like a groundswell coming up and we've seen it in Europe as well. And usually for everything, US and California are first. I think that's actually one of the few things where Europe is a little bit first, where people say, wow, I'm not gonna use my car anymore. I'm not gonna uh, travel by plane anymore. I mean, uh, people make a lot of fun of Greta and all those people, but th they did manage to change our perception of travel. And I think that in five or 10 years, if you arrive with your, when you go and visit your sister, if you drive, uh, people will say, we look at you like if you smoked a cigarette in the living room. And this is, you will see, it's, it's just going to change and we'll all feel it's normal because there's just no other way what we do is not sustainable. And we will all look up, back upon this and we will laugh uh, at how stupid and how weird we were to sit in a two-ton metal metal box. And, and in, in the immediate for us, what, what we see is that it's like with cigarettes, the, what, what works best if you look at data is when you raise the price. So the best way for us to attract people to kind of a non-cigarette lifestyle in transport is to uh, lower the price. We always start with very low prices. And I think that's probably something also for public agencies kind of to look into it, there are many public agencies that actually go for free transport. And I think that that's kind of the flip uh, flip side of the coin, where especially when you see private options becoming cheaper and cheaper and competing with each other, like ride sharing, being super competitive on price, the answer uh, from a city would be to say, okay, I mean, I'm, uh, I I'm doing this for the good of the people, so I'm gonna, my service will be free for the residents of the city. So we see a lot of experiments around that in Europe now, and it seems the first results are super encouraging. And in terms of utilization, is really growing. So one like frequency, uh, Ladonna, you mentioned this. Then very very cheap price and making it easy to find. So getting closer and uh, easy to buy to book like for everyone inclusivity. And then of course uh, just and then it's gonna come on its on its own. Awesome. Yeah, and thank you. And 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 somebody uh, commented, uh, you know, how can we get all the, you know, integrate with all the transit agencies in the Bay Area? Um, and we actually just launched Free Transit here just a week ago. I was at the press conference for all uh, K through 12 students and community college students in LA County. So we're really excited about that opportunity because we do think that it creates the next generation of riders, creates all these educational benefits as well. Um, and targets a population that's very, very low income. 80% of LAUSF yeah. students are in poverty. So we're excited yeah, about know, that. 70% uh, of, of Luxbus passengers uh, tell us they take the bus for the first time. Wow. 70%. So it's it's their first time. So I, I think it's quite a stretch, right? When a new restaurant opens in your neighborhood, they're going to give away little pizza pieces, right? On the, on the, on the, on the street to people who pass by, passes by so that they can try it. This is why we do $5 tickets, $9 tickets, because uh, when we launch, because that's the quickest way to build up ridership to build, yeah. and to, to share the experience. It's, uh, it's also more efficient. Uh, I'd rather do that than do a big marketing campaigns. Uh, it's easier to give the money straight to your passengers and they deserve it more. So it's, um, in the end, it works better. That's great. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, I'd like to, and you know, it's a good kind of segue to uh, our friends at at Brightline, um, who are also sort of innovating in this space and creating new opportunities uh, for people to take uh, transit probably for the first time, um, you know, in, in, in spaces where they would normally drive or take a car. I want to uh, bring up, uh, we've got Ben Court uh, from Brightline. It's the, privately, uh, the only privately owned inner city rail service in the United States. And uh, Ben's the senior vice president. 
Uh, it's a private, we call it as private sector solution to a public need with the goal of shifting travel by road and air uh, to rail instead. And they're, they're operating service already from Miami and that's where Ben's joining us to Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach. Uh, but their newest project, which we'll talk about is the 170 mile route from Rancho Cucamonga in San Bernardino and eventually Los Angeles to Las Vegas, Nevada uh, with a, a fully electric zero emission high speed train uh, running down the I-15. So um, I'll, uh, I'll also post an, an interesting, a fun link from Fast Company about Brightline, uh, but I'll let uh, Ben take it from here. Thanks, Eli. I appreciate it. I think you guys have my uh, presentation, so I'll wait for that to, to be pulled yep. up. There but just go. as a matter of uh, introduction, you know, Brightline is, is a privately funded project that initiated in Florida. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I'll just explain a little bit of who we are. Uh, but we are private equity backed by Fortress Investment Group out of New York. Um, and Fortress Investment Group acquired a freight system in, South, uh, in the state of Florida back in 2007. And in 2012 began plans to create the first privately funded passenger rail system in this country in more than a century. And today we consider ourselves to be the only provider of modern eco-friendly high-speed rail in the United States. We're operating in South Florida between Miami and West Palm Beach, uh, which is only 70 miles, uh, but we're under construction all the way to connect our ultimate route, which is Miami to Orlando. Our goal as a company is to connect city pairs that are too short to fly and too far to drive. So we're not trying to build an entire nationwide system, but we are trying to look for those corridors that are 200 to 400 miles uh, where we know that there's both a business set of travelers and a leisure set of travelers between city pairs that are that are incredible destinations. We have a great one in Florida between Miami and Orlando, which is 235 miles. And then our first expansion outside of the state is uh, between Las Vegas and the Southern California area. Uh, go to the next slide. I'll tell you just a little bit about um, our Florida system. Um, and you can see it there. Uh, we'll, we'll completely, uh, by the time we you know, finish our system from Miami to Orlando, that'll be a total of about $5 billion in private dollars, uh, which is pretty incredible. Um, we're currently under construction from West Palm Beach to Orlando. That project will be completed by the end of next year. We're creating thousands of jobs on this project. Um, it's 65% complete and will be, uh, like I said, done by the end of next year. We've already built and are operating uh, three stations in South Florida. And in our first full calendar year, we carried over a million people. Um, and we're on target to double that uh, when we temporarily suspended operations for COVID. Good thing is uh, we opened back up in about four weeks um, here in South Florida. And uh, we, we think that we'll have a high rate of adoption, no different than, than what we saw in 2019. And if you go to the next slide, um, I'll tell you a little bit of why. Like uh, you, you've asked a lot of good questions, like how do we get people out of the car? Um, one of the things that we got to do is we got to make the experience pretty incredible. Um, one of the things that I tell our public sector partners all the time, uh, because we connect into all of the public sector uh, systems here in South Florida, from uh, metro rails to people movers to their bus systems, is the public sector in many ways have got to step their game up. Like people are looking for unique experiences when they walk into a train station. And when you come into a Brightline station, uh, we've built it through the lens of the modern traveler. And we look at it through the lens of all the senses. So you walk into our Miami Central Station, which is amazing. And we've taken everything that people are familiar with with train travel, which is typically gray, dreary, and smells bad. And we flipped it on its head. And you walk in and we have a signature scent it's beautiful, it's bright, it's full of energy. Uh, there's modern food halls, there's great uh, food and beverage, high-end craft, uh, you know, luxury, you know, drinks, food and wine. And it's a completely touchless, cashless environment. Um, and that was even before COVID. And we've stepped it up since then. One of the things that will open up in a few weeks is what we're calling a completely autonomous market so that people will get to walk into a grab and go market uh, there will be no congregations, no lines, and you'll still have access to anything uh, that you could possibly want. If you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of hit the high points on our Southern California project. This is a project that's, um, that has been talked about for decades, 
uh, but was a late stage development company previously known as Express West that we acquired in 2019. And it's a series of inner city rail projects that goes between Vegas and LA Union Station. Um, we have it completely environmentally cleared and essentially ready, a shovel ready between Las Vegas and Victor Valley. And we're working to uh, extend that line from Victor Valley to Rancho Cucamonga. And in Rancho Cucamonga, we would partner uh, with San, San Bernardino County to connect into a station where Metrolink goes uh, to LA Union Station and elsewhere throughout the Southern California world. Uh, we would also have access to Ontario Airport um, and potentially, based on what I've heard today, maybe we could turn this into a, a Flixbus station. Uh, but when we look at our stations, we look at them not as a train station, but as a multimodal hub. And you'll see that in what we're building in Florida, and you'll see that in what we're planning in Southern California. So at Rancho Cucamonga, um, you'll have everything that you need to get to your final destination. And in fact, in, in South Florida, in a few weeks, when we relaunch our system, we will launch a full door-to-door -door system uh, for anybody looking to plan their journey. We think that that simple and that ease and frictionless form of travel is going to get people out of their cars uh, and form a seamless last mile connectivity to their final destination. This full system here is about 260 miles. It'll be approximately $8 billion worth of investment. If you go to the, the next slide, I'll just show you, you know, what that investment breaks down to. These projects, um, don't come around often. And we've seen incredible support in California from uh, all from the governor's office all, uh, to our, our main champion, who is Fiona Ma, the California state treasurer, all the way down to local electeds. Um, because these projects provide such an incredible um, economic impact and environmental impact. You know, this project alone is gonna create over 40,000 jobs, a thousand permanent jobs. Um, the economic impact will total somewhere around $9 billion um, and that includes a billion dollars in, in tax revenue. And we look at environmental impact um, through tons of CO2 removed, which will be close to a half a million tons annually and over 3 million cars removed off the road. We, we see about 11 and a half million people, over 11 million people riding this train back and forth between Vegas every year. There'll be fully electric zero emission uh, trains um, and they'll be competitive from a price standpoint with the cost of flying um, and certainly much more convenient and better than car travel. Um, next slide. That's it. That's my next slide. But um, <laughs> what I what, I, you know, the, a few final points on, on Brightline West is um, it's an eight billion dollar project. You know, we look at the transportation world as an ecosystem. We've heard from Flixbus, we've heard from California High Speed Rail. Um, we see both of those as you know, potential partners in what we're building. At the Palmdale station that we're looking at uh, with the city of Palmdale, that's where California High Speed Rail would ultimately end up. We would connect into them. We would serve as the, the east-west hub to their north-south connection. And so in order for us to create this nationwide high speed rail system, um, it's got to be done by connecting into other forms of transportation that are both clean, green, fast, modern, um, and high-end technology that people want to get out of their cars and into a service like ours. Um, happy to take any questions, Eli, from you or yeah. anybody who's, no, I, I, who's I love there. I love it, and I love that you know we're we're creating these uh, uh, these opportunities for connectivity. Um, uh, between different agencies. And I think too, you know, we're about to hear from Metrolink as well. And I think there's an opportunity to connect uh, with Metrolink, which also goes to Palmdale um, and, and is planning uh, some service out to, uh, or has service out to Ontario as well. So I think you're right. Like sort of the interconnectivity is the secret sauce uh, as, as, as uh, Denny likes to say of making a system work. Um, and so that's, that's it's really uh, great to hear that that's the kind of thinking behind it. Um, and I always love, you know, I, I, I always prefer to take rail over flying just because like simply like you can just show up like 10, 15 minutes before the train leaves, you know, and you don't have to like deal with all the security issues of going to an airport. And it's just so much, you know, particularly here in LA, it's such a, such a hassle. Um, I'm, I'm really interested, you know, 
how do you how did you shift that culture around train travel you know in another place like Florida which is notorious for their cars and you know how are you uh, you know how do we learn from that in California and then you know kind of the other question really is is how do you how are we financing build faster and at a lower cost than, than some public projects how are you how are you able to achieve that yeah let me, let me answer that question first because I think it's an important piece of our business model um, you know I think the key part to, to creating fast high-speed rail is to tap into existing transportation systems and here's what I mean by that in the United States we have the greatest highway system probably ever built. And in fact, when Europe began investing in uh, their their rail after World War II, we began investing in, in highways. And looking back, that feels like a bad decision, but it doesn't have to be a bad decision. Um, and we also have the greatest freight system in, in the world as it relates to rail. And so for Brightline, one of the ways that we've been up and running so quickly in Florida, we started construction in 2014. We were completed in 2017 started operating shortly thereafter. And then our system uh, to Orlando will take about three additional years from 2019 to 2022. The, the way in which we're able to do that is we're only building into existing transportation systems. So we built along the freight system that um, our private equity sponsor had owned. And then for the part that we are connecting to the Orlando airport, we're building directly alongside uh, one of the Florida highways. And in, in California and Las Vegas, we have a right-of-way agreement with uh, Caltrans for the I-15 highway. So this train, Brightline West, will be built right down the middle of the I-15 highway. The beauty of that is that it's essentially engineered to a degree. It's already environmentally impacted. Um, and you don't have to go through the arduous process of eminent domain or finding um, property owner, you know, private property owners, court battles, things like that, which do plague other systems and ambitions throughout the country. So tapping into existing transportation systems is what is going to allow us to speed high-speed rail up in this country. And, um, you know, we're excited when you look at the, uh, the investment that's being discussed in Washington, D.C. right now, which will be somewhere between 66 and $80 billion dollars. You know, we testified in front of Congress in May and we said in order to expedite these systems, you got to look at the existing highway routes. And that's where we have to build uh, high speed rail systems. But in order to make the, the system complete, you can't just drop somebody off, you know, at a train station that's not connected to anything. That's where the, the systems that you and I are just talking about, Metrolink um, and other forms of connectivity have to exist in order to make it appealing for everybody to take. And in that long-winded answer, I completely forgot your first question, which maybe you did too. No, no, I, you started to answer it, which was like shifting that culture. And I think that's, that hits on the right point. I mean, that I the stress that I had of getting three kids under the age of 10 and four bags, four blocks from the ferry terminal to the train terminal, like that was like the biggest reason I almost didn't do the whole trip on on, on transit and just decided, you know, we'll just order like an Uber, get us to the train station, you know, and that interconnectivity is, is so critical, especially if you're, you know, a business or a leisure traveler. Let me, let me add one other thing to that too. I think that the other thing that gets people out of their cars for some of these medium haul trips uh, are hospitality, is, is hospitality. Um, and so when people walk into our train stations, one, they see a difference in experience. And I think for, for us, like when people try it, getting people to the station the first time is the hardest. Once they see it, they understand it, they come back. Um, but the hospitality aspect is key. And we've done this in South Florida and our plan between California and Vegas is for folks going from California to Vegas, um, you'll be able to check in to your hotel, to your resort at our train station. Those bags will be delivered to your room. And so when you get off our train, go do whatever you want. All of your luggage, all of your check-ins has already been taken care of. Those are the small bits and pieces that we have to think about because that's what this generation of travelers expects. And so it's not just, you know, getting them from place to place. It's that extra touch. We did that here in South Florida for the cruise industry. And we saw many cruise travelers getting on our train, knowing that their luggage and their suitcases would show up in their stateroom without them, you know, having to do any of that for themselves. Right. So it's those extra touches of hospitality that I think matter. Uh, certainly the airlines aren't going to do that. 
Um, we've seen that, but we can do that in a train industry. All right. Well, I hope Darwin and I hope uh, LaDonna are, are listening to on the, on the public agency side and, and we're going to kick it over to uh, Jeff in a minute as well. Um, but, you know, and one kind of final kind of question and transition on that is, you know, business and leisure travelers, and this question comes from our executive director, Denny Zane, the business and leisure travelers are typically higher income. How do we make this an opportunity for everyone? And I think, you know, that's, that's a good way to segue also to uh, Jeff over at Metrolink. Um, so I'll let you answer that and then, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Jeff. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, um, we don't have prices yet for our, our tickets between Vegas and the Southern California area, but um, it's going to be cheaper than flying and it's going to be, um, you know, more efficient and safer than dry, driving. So like you're probably looking at about a hundred dollar one way ticket between Miami and Orlando. That's, I mean, that's going to be hard to beat with anything that's out there. Um, it's, this is not a subway system. It is a, a medium haul system. And so you have to have um, enough to pay for your operations. But, but we see this as completely com more competitive from a price point than flying. Um, and I think uh, just because the experience is high doesn't mean it's only for folks from a higher income. Um, and, and we've been able to show that and share that in South Florida um, in many different ways. Oops, I'm on mute. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Well, let me, um, let's, uh, we want to wrap up our kind of panel with uh, Jeff. Um, he is the director. Thanks, Jeff, for sticking around. And then we'll have a little back and forth and maybe uh, we'll, we'll get everybody up on and you can uh, maybe respond to some of the discussion we've had. But Jeff is uh, director of government and community relations for Metrolink, which is Southern California's 538 route mile commuter rail agency serving the region's six counties and 21 million uh, residents and we love Metrolink. <laughs> it's the unknown unknown agency that uh, that we we've come to love and we want more people to ride. So uh, Jeff, um, you know, uh, and I know we we talked a little bit yesterday about you know this this idea of uh, subsidies uh, for for you know sort of equity issues and and lower income travelers, you know, especially those who are working in industries in the big cities, but. Let me let me let you kind of. I know you got a presentation, um, but uh, I know that was part of it. So, kick it over to you. Very good, um, uh, Eli. Are you going to be running the presentation? Or yeah, you got it there. Okay, uh, it's great, and I, I'm really uh, glad that that, uh, that you asked that question. And before I get into the presentation about you know reminding people of of MetroLink because I, we do feel in some in some sectors it is a bit of an unknown agency. So we'll go through that in the presentation, but. On the equity piece, which is so important now, um, you know, before the pandemic, we surveyed our riders and, um, you know, Metrolink does uh, traditionally service a professional class of, of rider that goes longer distances, of course, uh, across Southern California uh, between their destinations. The average household income uh, pursuant to those surveys was $93,000 a year, which is, of course, um, much, much higher than your typical public transit um, demographic. Now, during the pandemic, where we had very, very substantial um, uh, decreases in ridership, uh, almost half of our ridership today um, indicates that their household income is under $50,000. So it's a very significant shifting and we're watching that very closely because as riders come back to our service, we're seeing a lot of um, students uh, coming back. Uh, we've seen a 40% increase in our student ridership just during the pandemic from the initial pandemic um, um, cuts in riders to today. Um, we, we've seen very large, significant, robust um, increases in essential workers. Uh, so, um, and we're building up on that, you know, for the future to try to, to try to get the word out with, with some of our um, uh, fare structures that we have worked on during the pandemic and that we want to do in the future to make our service more accessible, um, because that absolutely will be the future of uh, commuter uh, rail travel in Southern California. So I just wanted to get that out there. I think it's a very important piece and I'm glad that Move LA is, is um, 
you know, highlighting, put a spotlight on that. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, just to talk about um, Metrolink itself. Again, we are the regional rail system uh, for Southern California, we commuter rail. Um, typically our riders before the pandemic um, would ride over 30 miles each way uh, on their uh, route from, uh, from home to work and back. So um, this, is, uh, this is our niche, this is what we do. We, we serve uh, the people of Southern California principally who have to go beyond their city and in many cases, even beyond their county uh, to get to their destination on a daily basis. As it so shows here in the uh, slide, we have uh, six counties served a 538 route mile um, network. We have seven lines, um, 63 station cities uh, on our service. And I have to say, you know, before the pandemic, um, it was just a, a tremendous story of Metrolink's growth. For the five years prior to the pandemic, we broke records of ridership. Culminating in 2019, we had uh, just under 12 million riders of Metrolink in that year. Uh, and we were on pace uh, in 2020, going through the year, to break that record in 2020. Um, so uh, during that time, uh, just to give you an idea of what that means, that's the equivalent, or that was actually the equivalent of removing 9.3 million cars off of the highways and surface streets. Um, and so when you think about 9.3 million cars <laughs> off the roads that would otherwise you know, be on the roads and the average person who's riding, um, uh, who would have otherwise been driving is traveling over 30 miles each way. It has a tremendous benefit both in congestion relief as well as um, uh, reduction of vehicle miles traveled and um, greenhouse gas emissions. And so what that equated to was for that year, 339 million vehicle miles traveled were avoided uh, by removing those cars and um, 130,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas uh, CO2 emissions um, were averted uh, by uh, shifting those travelers from single occupancy vehicles to the train. That's the equivalent, uh, environmentally speaking, of planting a 170,000 acre forest uh, just from the riders uh, on Metrolink in that one year. So next slide. This slide, which I admit is, is a little bit overwhelming, <laughs> charts um, the pandemic ridership recovery. All of public transit across the country was devastated by um, the initial outbreak of the pandemic. At Metrolink, we had 90% plus reductions in riderships when, when the stay-at-home orders were first issued in California. Uh, so that's you know, a 90% plus hit in, in our ridership. And what we've noticed is that at riders have come back and it's been very sensitive to um, the status of the pandemic itself. So as, as uh, pandemic impacts, um, uh, COVID transmission rates, hospitalizations, et cetera, reduce, the economy opens up a little incrementally and we get more riders. Um, when there's a spike, unfortunately, in uh, effects of the pandemic, such as uh, last uh, fall and winter, when we had the, the spike in the pandemic, our ridership precipitously declines. Uh, and uh, we've seen that uh, also uh, this year with the Delta variant. Right now, we're at just at 40% of pre-pandemic um, ridership on our, our best performing line, the uh, Paris Valley line. Uh, and then that goes all the way down to 15% uh, on the Riverside Valley line. Again, there are a lot of factors. It's very, uh, very, a um, lot of factors that, that go into that ridership recovery. Um, but what we do know is, from surveying our riders, and we had over 11,000 of them respond during the pandemic, 85%, two, two figures about 85%. First of all, 85% of our riders have a car and they choose Metrolink. And 85% have said during the pandemic that they, that they intend to return to full ridership of Metrolink as a regular part of their work commute patterns. So we're very encouraged by that. And we think is the, um, as the effects of the pandemic continues to subside, we know that there is demand there for very sensitive return to ridership. Uh, next slide. 
Yes, our SCORE program. So this is um, something I want to talk a little bit about, about how um, we want to expand our service uh, throughout Southern California to help get the region ready for the Olympic Games, uh, to help uh, enhance the connectivity that we've been talking about um, uh, throughout this presentation today to help our service get ready to meet high-speed rail when it gets to Southern California, which will be transformational for everyone. Um, we have the Southern California Optimized Rail Expansion Program. It's our 10-year, $10, $10 billion uh, capital improvement program with the principal goal of getting to 30-minute headways across our 500-mile network. We want, we've talked some a little bit today about reliability, about increasing headways so that when people take commuter rail in Southern California, they know that they can catch a train every 30 minutes anywhere across the region, and they can make those connections um, to uh, their local bus service, uh, to their place of work, or eventually to high-speed rail when it gets here, and to other services like Brightline. Next slide. Phase one of this project. The good news is it's paid for. Thank you very much to a very generous grant from the state um, but for the Transit Intercity Rail Capital Program grant, $875 million, the largest in our agency's history. I think we Darwin had a, a, a little piece of that probably. <laughs> yes, uh, 2.3 billion overall uh, from all sources, federal sources um, from the state and local match dollars, um, 19 projects. Um, uh, that will help uh, increase those headways and, and uh, increase reliability uh, uh, throughout the network. Again, to get the region ready, principally for the LA Olympic Games. All of these projects, which are paid for and which are currently on schedule, we envision having them completed, not the entire SCORE program, but the phase one by 2028 to get the region ready for the Olympics because we know there's gonna be a crush of people. Of course, these projects and the benefits from them will accrue for generations in Southern California. So um, this is uh, really um, job one for Metrolink moving forward. Next slide. Some of the benefits um, that will accrue from this program, um, the ones that are listed here are 2050 figures. By the way, these figures are not ours. They're from the LA uh, Economic Development Corporation independent study. This was conducted in 2019, just before the pandemic. So um, obviously some of these figures will um, undoubtedly be impacted by uh, the ridership um, and the, the um, overall um, trajectory of recovery from the pandemic. But the figures there speak to the overall economic impact and jobs impact of the SCORE program. And this is not just the first phase that goes through 2028, but the whole program through 2050, um, if you look at this, 1.36 million jobs uh, in, in total in Southern California, that's 40, um, 42,500 jobs per year um, will be generated from this program uh, from now until 2050, assuming that funding is forthcoming for the entire SCORE program during that time period. It'll add $1.17 trillion to the uh, Southern California economy. Uh, and so those are our staggering numbers uh, that can have uh, immediate transformational benefits to the economy while um, improving this connectivity uh, long-term for Southern California. Uh, next slide. This, this highlights, again, LAEDC figures, uh, the environmental impacts of the SCORE program uh, once it is fully developed. The green cars there, um, those figures are vehicle miles traveled by county. Uh, the other uh, figure there uh, refers to greenhouse gas uh, reductions. Um, throughout the life of the study from 2023 through 2078, if SCORE is fully built out, uh, it is estimated to remove 3.4 billion uh, vehicle miles traveled from the streets and roadways and freeways and almost 52 million metric tons of GHG emissions um, uh, during that time period. So uh, extremely, extremely a significant impact on the environmental side um, should the program uh, be fully funded and developed. Uh, next slide. 
Um, the building. Oh yeah, yeah. I was gonna. I, I, this is the last one, right? I, this is the last have a couple one. minutes. Yeah, perfect. Then, then we can do this. Is just I wanted to highlight the the action that our board has taken. Um, very significant action with our climate plan action plan that was uh, that was uh, passed earlier this year. It sets a uh, moonshot uh, goal of zero emissions for our, um, our our rail agency by 2028. Of course, that is contingent on two very important things. First, uh, the development of uh, zero emission technology in the rail sector, uh, a sector that has been woefully lack, lacking in investment that we hope to see uh, change in the coming years. And then secondly, the funding to implement that uh, technology. What I can say is that at Metrolink over the last Five years or so, we've invested $260 million in converting three-fourths of our locomotive fleet um, to the cleanest uh, diesel locomotive available in the world commercially now, the Tier 4 locomotive. Um, those um, uh, We have 40 of them now in service, uh, three-fourths of our uh, fleet. And um, uh, with uh, uh, tremendous environmental uh, benefits uh, that we hope to uh, move to zero emission as the technology uh, makes itself available. We have demonstration projects um, that are ongoing, not only in, within our network, but around the state to help move that technology forward. And our board has recognized that um, in this action plan. One final That's program it. that we have going right now is the Renewable Diesel Program. Um, we are in the process of testing. We've already tested it on our tier twos. We're testing in our tier fours to use renewable diesel um, on our entire fleet that we hope to have implemented by summer of next year. So I'll stop that's there a, and happy to take you. That's, that's a perfect pitch, actually, for our program next week on Thursday at 12 o'clock. We actually have an expert from World Energy is producing renewable uh, diesel here in Southern California. Yes. We have an expert who uh, has got battery technology for locomotives that can do the duty cycle for Metrolink. And we've got uh, uh, Ray Wolf, who's at SD uh, County uh, Transportation Agency that's got a zero emission hydrogen uh, fuel cell yes. uh, technology that they're, te they're, they're testing, which is really exciting. So I think... Uh, we're gonna have some sparks fly, I think, uh, next uh, next week. And I want to see maybe if we can get a couple sparks flying uh, in the in the last fifteen minutes here. Um, you know, and I love that. Uh, you know, Marissa, if you want to bring kind of everybody up on the panel, um, I, you know, I love that. Did you, what did you say? One hundred seventy acre forest. One hundred seventy thousand acre forest was the uh, environmental uh benefit of, of uh, the removal of 12 million of 9.3 million cars from the freeways for people that were removed because they took metro wow. I mean that's that's just incredible and you know I mean we spent uh, you know previously we've spent four sometimes 500 million dollars per year in subsidies for electric cars and trucks in the state and I, you know I almost wonder like if we spent that amount of money for medium and long distance rail and bus service right so that we had more frequent service you know I wonder how many more, millions of cars we can remove from surface streets. And uh, I, so uh, you know, I'm, I, that's kind of one question if, if, you know, if anybody wanted to take that on, but also you know, it, we, we spoke a little bit towards the ends about subsidies to low income riders, you know, and, 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 and the fearless program that we just launched. And I'm wondering, you know, how do we continue to fund those programs? Because we do have a very large low income population in California. How do we ensure that, you know, that benefit of these products, both public and private, sort of in year to those who really struggle um, with transportation costs. So uh, have at it. <laughs> Anyone want to take that on? Well, I guess I'll start at least at, at what we're doing here at, at Metrolink. I mean, during the pandemic, uh, one of the first things that we did was institute um, a more flexible fare, uh, which is a, kind of the, the f flexible five-day pass during a month. Recognizing that our monthly rider during the pandemic didn't need to ride Metrolink every single day, so we give people a five-day flex pass. You can use it any day within the month, um, and um, that's fine. We also um, re uh, reduced our fares, and we have free service on the weekends um, for children and reduced uh, flat fare on the weekend as well. 
More importantly, though, for low income riders is that we have um, been the recipient of a uh, cap and trade low carbon transit operations uh, grant in the, middle of, in the amount of $1.7 million. And we're currently um, uh, working on how to implement that program uh, next year uh, in a manner that we'll be able to verify um, income status of riders uh, so that they can use our service for 50% off fare. So that is in the process of being uh, developed now, and we hope to have that uh, as soon as possible uh, next year. Yeah, Eli, I'll, I'll weigh in if I could. Um, we, we don't have fares yet. We're, we're not operating. But uh, a couple things I want to say about the equity side of things. I, I'm really proud of the fact that we're bringing um, high-speed rail into Central Valley um, and, and really connecting the state in that way. Uh, I didn't talk much about our Palmdale to Burbank section, but that will be, from an engineering standpoint, one of our most challenging sections, but also because it's going through mountainous territory, um, but it's also a game changer. Um, so what's currently a minimum hour drive we'll be doing in 20, 25 minutes. So it really opens up an opportunity for housing flexibility um, that somebody somebody could maybe if you don't have to commute it every day especially um, post COVID more virtual stuff uh, maybe you only come into the office a couple of days a week and I think there's some some real options there um, particularly connecting that that Burbank to the Antelope Valley uh, with high speed rail so I, I do think there's some game changers coming and we're excited to be a part of that awesome and uh, oh go ahead Pierre Sorry, just uh, there are a few uh, simple ways that even don't involve giving us, us any money. Um, first, you you can reduce uh, fares. Uh, sorry, you can reduce tolls in California for for buses. Uh, you can create more uh, dedicated lines for buses. Like you see, you see a lot of them on the East Coast, for instance, entering New York. I and mean, you you mentioned. Um, that it's, it's a very big relation, for instance, Philly to New York, and they have a dedicated la lane for buses. If you would do something similar on LA San Diego, for instance, you would see, uh, I mean, we are already competitive with the car, with the bus, honestly, but we can be even more competitive. And if you are cheaper, more comfortable, uh, easier to, because you don't have to take the parking equation out of the, of the way, uh, easier to, to travel with, and you are quicker or much quicker now because there is no more traffic. I think that that would be a very easy win and it's, it, it doesn't cost any money. Um, I was, I was going to, yeah. thank you for bringing that up because I was going to make that suggestion. Maybe it's something that we talk about with Calsta and the CapDi. Uh, real, real quick, um, you know, we've been working really hard to get uh, this infrastructure bill uh, passed in Congress. Uh, we've been pushing, we have a national coalition called the National uh, justice uh, transit justice coalition where we've been pushing for better service if that passes <laughs> what would that mean for your projects would it would it mean moving your projects forward and maybe and I, I know you have to jump maybe you have a, a just can speak a little bit to that and then and darwin and ladonna and jeff and, and pierre yeah sure um well one i you know it's it's never been more important for us to invest in strengthening our infrastructure if you look at the US, I mean, we're the wealthiest country in the world, but we rank 13th um, you know, in, in the world when it comes to overall quality of our infrastructure. So this is an opportunity uh, you know, to improve upon that. When it comes to high-speed rail, um, we look at the dollars that they're putting in as an opportunity to move beyond simply rehabbing existing infrastructure, which is a large part of what the high-speed rail dollars would go to. Um, and we see Brightline West as an opportunity to help build a new high-speed rail system. We, we are advocating that uh, private entities like ours would be eligible for some of these new grants. Um, in the cases where they partner with public entities, whether it's Metrolink, uh, you know, CalSTA, you name it, these grant programs being created should focus on the type of projects that we look forward to competing for these dollars. And we look forward to competing for these types of dollars um, and because I think that in order to build a nationwide system that we envision, um, you got to have multiple models at the table. It can't just be uh, the Amtrak model or the California high speed rail model or the Brightline model. It's got to be all those different models building a national high speed rail system over the next few years. So um, for Brightline West, 
we see ourselves as the most shovel ready project in the nation uh, that couldn't be built and completed in a relatively short period of time. And we're certainly positioning ourselves for some of these grants, depending upon what happens over the next several weeks in DC. Well, let's hope. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on that one? I'll say for, for, uh, for Metrolink, um, we're very, very happy to see a couple of things. First of all, the formula funding amounts uh, proposed in the, in the bill are a, a significant bump up nationally, which will, of course, uh, impact formula, ongoing formula funds that we rely upon and other modes as well. Secondly, um, there's an over three times increase in the Chrissy Grant Program, the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure Grant Program. We as a commuter rail agency are not fully eligible for all of those, um, for all uh, projects uh, that can be funded through that program. We hope uh, that that can be addressed in, in legislation, but we certainly are um, uh, uh, partially um, uh, eligible for the funds in that program and to have such a robust increase um, will be, you know, very important for us. There's also a lot of money, uh, I think a little bit over $3 billion a year for uh, grade crossings, for safety and improvements in crossings, which uh, we have over 350 of. Um, we have plenty of those that will compete well for that. So we're very much, very hopeful that the bill will, uh, will be uh, acted on before the end of this month. Well, and, and, and you know, I have, uh, Pierre's point, I, you know, I hope that, you know, that when the state gets some of that money, they can also think about, um, you know, dedicated bus lanes on longer distance routes on highways in particular. You know, I mean, we do have a lot of uh, carpool lanes, but we could always use some more so that buses can go in them. LaDonna, are you expecting a big check? Uh, I'm hoping. Um, I, I'm going to say <laughs> ditto, ditto to, to what Jeff said. Uh, honestly, my focus is getting our environmental work done. Uh, we we finished in Southern California. We finished Bakersfield to Palmdale. Like I said, we're doing Burbank to LA next. Can't spend can't spend dollars if you, you haven't finished the environmental work. So that's really been right. the focus and priority. And I think somebody said earlier, this is a marathon and we're plugging away. We're making good progress. And, and hopefully those those little steps of what becomes available uh, will be ready for. Awesome. Perhaps Thank maybe you. the yeah, a part of the program is about charging infrastructure and building uh, really tens of thousands of charging stations for cars, which it sounds great on paper, but a car, like if you replace the whole uh, US fleet, car fleet with electric cars, you are you are not solving the problem. You are maybe even creating new problems as someone mentioned in their comments. Uh, it's really about sharing transportation. So we hope that some of these chargers will also be open to private operators to maybe charge their buses. Um, we, we mentioned the, pri the price of an electric bus, which is much higher. Uh, a, cha a charging station for an electric bus is also it's really no joke it's uh it, it it's it's a gigantic thing and it costs yeah you also have some environmental constraints and how to install it but it might be as much as two to three hundred thousand dollars in total to install one of these electric chargers so that that definitely uh creates another barrier to entry and then there's oh, yeah. just very quick comment uh, on in terms of infrastructure, sometimes it's not about having the nicest station, or it's just about being very efficient and even a bit scrappy. For instance, here in San Francisco, they built this giant um, station, which I hope soon we see the high speed train. But in the meantime, for instance, they they have all those bus bays, but they there are actually very few operators who end up using the bus bays, and many of the private operators we see. And I'm going close to the Caltrain station, which is just a different connectivity. Uh, and, and probably until the, the high-speed train comes, the, that station will be a, a little bit underused because they are actually, in a way, as a bus station, it's a bit of an overkill. Sometimes it's easier to just do curbside and, uh, and let people close to other, other transport uh, hubs. Yeah. Well, and I, and I hope you can join us next week, too, on October 14th, because I think, you know, I mean, battery is is great. But, uh, there's also the hydrogen fuel cell technology um, that's being developed in California. So we think that there's some good opportunity there, um, both for the fueling infrastructure, which creates really good jobs, um, but also the technology. Um, kind of on that, um, you know, and, and, and my, my colleagues reminded me, uh, you know, about our conversation next week. You know, and, and, and maybe this is 
I'll say Darwin, and maybe you can round this off, but a little bit to LaDonna and Jeff is, you know, diesel is, is problematic for air quality issues. You know, it's a carcinogen uh, declared by the state of California. And so, you know, just moving to renewable diesel, you know, still doesn't deal with the air quality issues. And, you know, there's been this debate about electrification, um, you know, of the system for high speed rail. And, you know, Ben was talking about how they're just doing elect electric. And so I wonder, especially with CAPDI and these goals for climate and, you know, the commitment from all the groups who are going to be pushing on it, honestly, and this is, this is our probably position as an organization, we would want to see, you know, only state money only going to subsidize, you know, particularly technologies that not have air quality impacts, um, but, you know, the, the most cleanest and the, and the highest speed technologies possible. So I don't know, Darwin or Jeff or LaDonna, if you wanted to comment on that, but that would be our Thank position. you for saying it. I, I, we're committed to we're committed to 100% electric renewable. It's the way to get the fast speeds. We can't get the faster speeds with other technologies. And, and it just makes sense if if you're building it from scratch to, to go all the way there. So awesome. To Love that. to hear that. Okay, that's yeah. cool. There was some debate Darwin. about that I heard at one point. And Darwin, go ahead. Yeah, I just before we end, just wanted to add that, you know, I think one of the things, one of the specific actions in CAPDI um, that we called out was using the trans rail capital program to uh, specifically prioritize zero emission um, infrastructure for for uh, transgender rail projects. So I think you know you can take that as a commitment for us um, as well. That you know we we you know uh, this is uh, just as much about mode shift as it is making sure that the options we're shifting to are clean. So um, uh, we're committed as well. Uh, I'll just say from Metrolink, zero emissions is our goal. Uh, the technology is not there. Um, we want um, to uh, do everything that we can to get there as quickly as possible. On the electrification issue, um, we want to see a proven electri uh, electrification uh, technology that will work in Southern California. We share our lines with the freights, um, a, a very significant portion in a very congested urban area. So we need to see an electrification system that will work across our region with freight railroads, with all of our partners. Um, and if we can get there, that's great. Um, but definitely Zimu is uh, our, um, our uh, goal number one. Awesome. Well, that's great to hear. It's a good place to end it. Um, I would encourage everybody who joined this one uh, as, as, as panelists to check out next week because we've got folks who say, hey, we can do it. Uh, we've got the technology and here's what we're testing. So I think next week will also be kind of a really good uh, 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 debate and conversation. Um, so that, that ends our program. Thank you to all of our speakers.